Find in your Bibles the New Testament book of 1 Thessalonians. I know you're shocked and surprised when I tell you to turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 9. We're in a verse-by-verse study through this New Testament book. I love studying the Bible line upon line and precept upon precept. I love studying the Word of God verse-by-verse. That's how it was written. That's how God wrote it. And so I like to study it that way. And tonight we come to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 9, and we'll look through verse 12 as we consider this subject, a godly life in a wicked world. A godly life in a wicked world. Now, as we've been studying this church in Thessalonica, the Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, we've come to understand that this was an impactful church. This was a sincere church. This was a faithful church. And indeed, as we've studied, I've talked about this sermon series, an irresistible church. This church impacted its community. It impacted its surrounding area for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so tonight, we're talking about what it means to live godly in the midst of a wicked and perverse world. Begin reading with me in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verse 9, and we'll read to verse 12. Paul writes, Now, concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God to love one another. For that is indeed what you're doing to all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more, and to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs, and to work with your hands as we instructed you so that you may walk properly before outsiders and be dependent upon no one. Remember, the power is in the perfect Word of God. Would you join me as we pray? Father, tonight would you add your blessing to the reading of your Word and now to its teaching. And would you transform our hearts through the living, powerful Word and the work of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a phrase used here in verse 10. It's also found in verse 1 of chapter 4. The phrase that Paul uses, I've circled in my Bible. He talks about how we ought to do this more and more. In your translation, it may say, excel still more. In other words, there's something that's important for us to do, and there's something that's important for us to do with excellence. There's something that we ought to do more and more. There's something that we ought to excel at. If I asked you the question, if you could pick one thing in life that you would like to excel in, what would that be? And some of you may say, well, I would want to excel in academics. I'd want to study hard. I'd want to take the tests. I'd want to have all the book learning that I could. I'd want to be a Ph.D. or an M.D. I'd want to be a professor. I would want to excel academically. Others would say, I want to excel in athletics. I want to make a million dollars in the NFL or the MLB or the NBA. I want to be an Olympic athlete. I want to excel in athletics. If I could pick one thing, that's what I would want to do. Others of you would say, well, I want to excel in business. I want to be a very successful business person. I want to make make something that helps people, and I want to fulfill a need and meet a niche in in the society and the economy, and I want to be a successful businessman or businesswoman. Others would say, I want to excel at video games. I want to be the best Fortnite player that there's ever been on the face of the earth, and I want to do the best I can at playing video games. There are others of you who may want to excel in various things. We may want to have mothers and fathers who excel in what it means to be a parent, or teachers who excel in being a teacher, or those in armed services excel at being an airman, or a soldier, or a marine, or whatever. But Here's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus Christ. If we could have picked one thing that we excel at in life, it must be as followers of Jesus that we excel in loving one another. In fact, that's what the Bible says here. We've been taught to love by God. We do this, Paul says to the Thessalonian believers, but we ought to do this more and more. So if you're here tonight and you'd say, I love the church, the people of God, and I love the world, and I love God, and I'm doing really good at that, I would say congratulations, and God says you ought to do it more and more. We could all do better and grow 
when it comes to loving others and loving the Lord. That's something we all ought to excel in. And there's no doubt we live in a wicked world. I don't have to tell you that. And I certainly should not have to prove to you the fact that we live in a wicked, fallen, sinful world. Crime, murder, abortion, sexual immorality, our societal norms crumbling before our very eyes. Our world is a wicked and vile place. And the Bible tells us that the world will be just that. We are not surprised by that fact. We could be heartbroken about it, but we're not surprised by it. We can be burdened by it, but we're not shocked by it. In fact, Jesus says to his followers in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 16, Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. What did Jesus say to those that were following him? We are sheep in the midst of wolves. How do we live a godly life as followers of Christ in the midst of a crazy and chaotic world? Now think about that. We need to be wise. We need to be sensible. We need to be careful. We need to be righteous. And that's what God's called us to do. In a world that is crazy and chaotic, mixed up, backwards, wicked, and destructive. Does anybody else find that it's difficult to do that from time to time? Maybe it's just me. I think all of us at times find it's hard to live right in a world that's so wrong. It's hard to be godly in a world that's so wicked. But the reality is Christianity is an incredibly practical faith. It is really what some scholars or teachers or commentators or preachers have said. Shoe leather faith that really it's where the rubber meets the road. It's where we ought to put one foot behind and in front of the other as we walk with the Lord each and every day. Now any religion, whether it's a false religion or the one true religion, relationship with Christ, any religion ought to... It ought to impact us on a moral level. It ought to cause us to try to do better. But the truth is, Christianity doesn't just seek to impact us on a moral level. It's more than just a do better, be good religion. The Bible tells us that the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't just put pressure from the outside to change the way we live or behave. The Bible says it transforms us from within. The power of the gospel of Jesus Christ, we are created into brand new creatures through Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, and now we are to live Christian lives in honor and glory to the Lord. Only belief in the gospel of Jesus Christ has the power of God to transform us so that we can live what we say we believe. That's why all these other religions are pressure from without to conform to some type of moral standard in hopes that we reach God. Well, the reality is we couldn't reach God, so God came to us in the perfect Son of God, Jesus Christ. He lived the life that we could not live. He bridged the gap. He made a way so that we might have the Holy Spirit of God inside of us, living and following and serving the Lord faithfully. Let's dive in as we look at verses 9 to 12 of chapter 4 in 1 Thessalonians. Here Paul shows us, How to live a godly life in the midst of a wicked world. First of all, we need a powerful foundation. There's a powerful foundation. We see that in the first two verses of this passage, verse 9 and verse 10. When it comes to the Christian life, the bottom line is love. That is the powerful foundation that we all need to follow Christ. The bottom line is love. So here, we have love that has been taught to us. That's what the Bible says. Look at verse 9. Concerning brotherly love, you have no need for anyone to write to you, for you yourselves have been taught by God. You've been taught by God to love one another. Paul says, I'm not even going to write to you about this. You don't even need me to write to you about this because you've been taught by somebody better than me. You've been taught by God to love one another. Now, Paul uses these words carefully, brotherly love. You might want to circle that or underline it in your Bible. This is the kind of love that believers are to demonstrate to one another. Did you know that as a, as a faithful father of the Lord Jesus Christ, did you know that you have a working understanding of the Greek language? Did you know that? You say, well, pastor, I'm not sure I know that. Well, you're right. Maybe there's certain words or phrases that you don't know. But here's a word or a phrase you do know. The, the, the phrase is brotherly love. You've heard of the city of brotherly love, right? If you go to the city of brotherly love, you might not find a lot of brotherly love. But you know, the city is Philadelphia. 
That's a Greek word. That's exactly the Greek word that Paul uses here, Philadelphia. It means brotherly love. So Paul is calling us to love the brothers, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because we belong to the same family, we have the same father, we should love one another. In fact, Paul says here, you've been taught by God to love one another. How? How have we been taught by God? Well, God the Father taught us to love each other when he gave Christ to die for our sins on the cross. The Bible says in 1 John 4, 19, we love because he first loved us. God the Son taught us to love one another. John chapter 14, excuse me, 13 and verse 34, he says, A new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you. God the Holy Spirit teaches us to love one another when he pours out the love of God in our hearts. That's Romans chapter 5 and verse 5. The the, the love of God has been shed abroad in your hearts, the power of the Holy Spirit of God. We've been taught by God how to love. How's that? Because God has shown us perfectly in Jesus Christ how he loved us, and that's how we ought to love one another. As Jesus was ministering on this earth, he explained to us, the world will know that we are Christians how? By this, all people will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. John 13, verse 35. He did not say that everyone will know you're a disciple if you come to Sunday night church. Sorry to burst your bubble. He he did not say that everyone will know you're a disciple if you carry your Bible around everywhere. Or if you listen to Christian radio. If you have a really cool fish on the back of your car. Or if you go to Christian school or if you support nonprofit organizations that spread the gospel to the nations. He did not say that they will know that we're Christians by how much we go to church. He said they will know that we are Christians by the love that we have for one another. That is the definitive proof and defining characteristic of what it means to be a follower of Christ. What is it? It is love that serves as the powerful foundation and testimony to the reality of the Christian life and faith in my heart. It's love. The early church historian in the third century, his name was Tertullian, once reported what Romans would say about Christians. There was a phrase they would use over and over again. See how they loved one another. That's what they would say about the early church. See how they loved one another. As exemplary as their love was in the first century, this church, 1 Thessalonians. Paul says they could still excel more, more and more. The the word in Greek literally means to superabound, to abound above, to continue to go on and on, to go to the limits of love and then go past those limits in loving one another. Specific opportunity remained for them to grow in their faith. And here's the reality. If we think that we don't have any more room to grow in our faith and in our love for others, that is proof that we definitely do. Because the reality is all of us have room to grow in our faith and in our love. Peter says, 1 Peter, 2 Peter, no, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 22, and it's repeated in 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 7. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purified your souls for a sincere love of the brethren. Look at this. Fervently love one another from the heart. What's that powerful foundation that we ought to have? We ought to love one one another. And here the phrase fervently love one another could literally be rendered in English, stretch out to the limits of love for others. Now we like to hear that, but we don't like to do that. Uh Uh-oh. I've gone from preaching to meddling now, right? We, We like to hear that, stretch out to the limits of love for others. But then, then when, when someone tests our limits, We don't like it very much. When they say something that they ought not to say to us or treat us in a way they ought not to or hurt us or someone that we love or pull out in front of us when we're going fine, cruising down the road or cut us off in traffic, we are tested in the limits of our love. And here Peter encourages us in 1 Peter 1.22 that we ought to stretch out to the limits of love. This is the foundation that every child of God needs. Do you know that, that love in the church of God would fix almost all the problems that we have? Listen now. Listen. 
love in the church would fix almost every problem that we face. I don't like what they said to me. They sat in my seat. They parked in my spot. They didn't say hey to me in the hallway. He didn't call me. They didn't visit. All these things. Listen carefully. If we genuinely love one another, it means we are going to give others the benefit of the doubt instead of throwing them under the bus at the very first chance that we have. Hello. And so if we genuinely love one another, it's not my seat anyway. It's not my spot. I've got to quit wearing my feelings on my sleeve. And if I genuinely love others, I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Our problem is that we always have the best excuses why we don't do something or why we act a certain way. But then when somebody else does the same thing, it's always out of a vicious or hurtful motive. But if we loved like we're supposed to, guess what would happen? It'd solve a lot of problems. Have you noticed, and think about this, what, what animals do instinctively? Have you noticed? Animals do instinctively what's necessary to keep them safe. Fish don't attend class to learn how to swim. I mean, even though they swim in schools, right? <laughs> yeah, I knew you'd like that. Birds by nature put out their wings and flap in order to fly. It's, it's nature that determines an action. Nature determines behavior. A fish swims because it has a fish's nature. A hawk flies because it has a hawk's nature. And the Bible says a Christian has God's nature, and we know that. Because a Christian loves. Ah, that's what it means to have the nature of God. That's what it means to have a relationship with God. That's what it means. A Christian ought to naturally love one another. Why? Because God is love. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. These are defining characteristics. Faith, hope, and love. And Paul says these are the defining characteristics of the Thessalonian church. Faith, hope, and love. Timothy had reported the good news of their love, 1 Thessalonians 3, 6. So Paul wasn't exhorting them to do something they hadn't been doing. He was saying, I'm proud of you. Keep it up and do more. Keep going. Press on. Church, listen. What we've done so far is good, but it's not over. And it's not good enough. There's still more people to love, more people to win, more people that need to be saved. And what we do is we continue more and more to share the message of the gospel and to increase and abound, 1 Thessalonians 3.12, in love for one another. A powerful foundation. Secondly, a practical instruction. A practical instruction, if our lives are going to stand up for Christ and stand out in the world, we have to love. But look, he, he doesn't just tell us to love, then he tells us practically what that looks like. Aren't you so thankful? The Word of God doesn't just tell us what to do, it tells us how to do it. it, it here the Bible tells us in Philippians 2.15 that we are to be blameless and innocent in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. It's a powerful, powerful message. This is what Paul tells us here in 1 Thessalonians as well. He gives us practical instructions. I love this. He doesn't just say, be good or do better. What's he say? Practically, verse 11, look at it now. And to aspire to live quietly and to mind your own affairs and to work with your hands as we instructed you. There is a lot of truth right here in this one verse. Three simple practical instructions. And, and, and I always get the picture. This is something that your grandma would tell you you're rocking on the front porch, right? I mean, look at it, right? Aspire to live quietly, mind your own affairs, work with your hands. That's what I'm going to tell you to do. Practical, simple, but powerful. Easy to understand, maybe a little bit more difficult to do. Let's walk through these real quick. First of all, he says, lead a quiet life. Lead a quiet life. Interesting. The phrase here, aspire to live quietly. That's how the English Standard Version translates it. Aspire to live quietly. The NIV and the New American Standard Bible, they say it like this. Make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. That seems almost 
like a paradox, doesn't it? If you're ambitious, if you make it your ambition, it doesn't seem like you would have a quiet life. If you're ambitious, that doesn't normally lead to being quiet. But the emphasis is on quietness of mind, quietness of spirit, inner peace that enables us through faith to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul didn't want them running around creating all sorts of problems in the world as they lived and worked in the world. In this phrase, Paul uses two verbs that seem to contradict one another. The first word he talks about, aspire, that means to be zealous, to strive eagerly, work hard. So here you've got this frenetic activity, work hard, try, give effort to be quiet. Does that seem to, like, it seems to not fit. Work hard, and then he says live quietly. It means to be silent, not speaking out inappropriately, to remain at rest, to be tranquil. Let's think about this. In anticipation of the Lord's return, we ought to live peaceful lives free of conflict and hostility towards others, which is a witness to the transforming power of the gospel. And so how do we, how do we bring this together? I'm supposed to be ambitious, make it my ambition. I'm supposed to work hard. I'm supposed to give lots of effort to live a quiet life. It's hard for us to understand until you've met somebody that has to work hard to be quiet. You know what I'm talking about? Somebody just got elbowed in the ribs. You ever met somebody that's got to work really hard to be quiet? That, you know, deep down inside there's all these words and thoughts and phrases that are bubbling up. And ultimately, maybe, just maybe, they have to work hard to, to turn it off. Maybe not you, but maybe somebody you know like that. The reality is there are some folks it takes a lot of effort and a lot of energy just to keep your mouth shut. And for the rest of us, we want to say thank you. So you get the picture now, don't you? Work hard to live a quiet and peaceful life. And secondly, mind your own business. Well, how about that? Be quiet and mind your own business. Paul said it, right? Inspired scripture. Lead a quiet life. And mind your own business. And another translation says, attend to your own business. Mind your own affairs. Now, this was a common statement in those days. This statement is not original with Paul. It was common in the Greek culture. And we don't know if Paul is just giving general instruction, as you would to a church. Hey, focus on what God has in front of you. Or if he's dealing with a specific issue. I tend to believe he's dealing with a specific issue that had arisen in the church at Thessalonica. And the reason I believe that is because if you look over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3... And verse 11 and 12, Paul deals with this again. He says, For we hear that some among you walk in idleness, not busy at work, just busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage you in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. And so here, I believe in 1 Thessalonians when he says, mind your own business, he's got some people in mind, and these people weren't minding their own business, they're minding everybody else's business. Uh Uh-oh, somebody just got elbowed again. People who wouldn't mind their own business. They're acting like busybodies. He says, they're not busy at work. They're busybodies. You know what that means? Hey, did you hear about so-and-so? I heard about so-and-so. Did you hear? Oh, did you know about this? Did you know about that? What about that? What's going to happen? These are the people that post on Facebook 9,000 times a day. (laughs) They have nothing else to do. They just want to keep it going, right? Just want to always, in everybody else's business, always minding other people's affairs, always in your face, asking you questions, wanting to know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? What about this? What about that? They always have something going on, and in the end, it's all kinds of activity, but it's like a hamster on a wheel. You never get anywhere. (sighs) Makes me tired just thinking about them. And here he says, don't do that. Mind your own affairs. Folks, I've got enough to keep me busy Just minding my own business. And I don't know how in the world some folks think it's their job to mind everybody else's business. And then guess what? They're not taking care of theirs. You know people like that. Paul says, mind your own business. Mind your own affairs. And then he says, work with your hand. Lead a quiet life. Mind your own business. Work with your hand. This is practical stuff. Work hard. Work with your own hands. Now, this is interesting because for the most part, the Greek culture, they despised physical labor. It was looked down upon. They had slaves to do that stuff. And so, 
they would say it, it's, it's the lower class that has to work with their hands. But Paul brings dignity to this. Paul brings dig, dignity to manual labor. Paul, as he preached the gospel, as he planted churches, guess, guess what he was doing on the side? He was making tents with his hands so that he could provide for himself financially and it had to be a burden to the church. And so here he's setting the example. Now, one of the things that happened in the church at Thessalonica is there was confusion about the return of Christ. We're going to deal with this as we move on. There was confusion. And so what some people thought was, Jesus ascended, he's coming back any day. And so what they did was, they quit their jobs, they quit working, and they sat around, and they stared at the sky. And they were just waiting. What you doing? Jesus is coming. What you doing? Jesus is coming. He said he was coming. And so I'm just going to sit here and do nothing until he comes back. Paul says, stop it. You need to get to work. You, you who say you're Christians, who say you love Jesus, you're being a bad testimony in the world. You've got employers that are depending on you, and you're sitting around staring at the sky Waiting for Christ to return, you quit your jobs, you have no money, the church is now burdened because they're having to support you because you say you're being spiritual, and that's the least spiritual thing you can do. Wow. Paul says, get to work. Do something. It's important for us to understand. There's a parallel for us as well. Man, we ought to be waiting expectantly for the return of Christ, but we ought to be working diligently until he comes. That's what we're called to do. A person went to the zoo. They saw at the zoo a monkey and a lion in the same cage. They asked the zookeeper, they said, how does that work? A monkey and lion in the same cage, that's marvelous. How do they get along? The zookeeper said, okay, usually they get along pretty good. Occasionally they have a little bit of a disagreement and we have to get a new monkey. He says, why do you have to get a new monkey? Because sometimes lions act like lions, and as long as lions act like lions, zookeepers will have to get new monkeys. Of course. There are times when Christians don't act like Christians. They ignore the influence of the Holy Spirit. They revert back to old patterns of living. They act in accordance with their old nature, not their new nature. And Paul gives us some practical instructions here as to how we can resemble the Father and allow the Holy Spirit of God to work in our lives. Practical instructions. Third, a proper reputation. Finally, if we're going to shine as lights in the dark, wicked world, we've got to have a proper reputation reputation. Paul's told us what it means to have the right foundation. Love for the Lord, love for others, love for one another, love for those in the world. Then he gives us practical instructions. Live a quiet life, mind your own business, work hard. And now he brings this all to a close telling us how important it is to have a proper reputation, a proper testimony in the world. So that you may, look at this, so that you may walk properly before outsiders. This is a purpose clause. You can see it in English. You don't have to know Greek. So that, in order that, because that's the purpose clause, right? He's telling us, had the right foundation, follow the Lord, trust in Him, do these practical things. Why? So that you may walk properly before outsiders. The purpose underlying Paul's encouragement here, motivating all of us, is to walk properly, to have a good testimony. For, for Paul, one of the keys to evangelism was that people actually lived like what they said they believed. And so if I believe in Jesus, if I've been changed by the power of the gospel, if I'm full of the Holy Spirit of God, it's going to change the way I live and the way I act, the way I think and what I do. Isn't that amazing? We're called to live in the, and work in the same way that brings honor and glory to Christ. One of, the, one of the most important ways that God draws people to himself is through the faithful actions of people who know Jesus. Did you know that? One of the ways that God draws unbelievers to the gospel is through believers who actually live what they say they believe. 
And so Paul is saying, instead of sitting around staring at the sky, mind your own business, get up, work hard, and shine as a light in the world. You'll be amazed at the testimony that is to others. One of the most powerful things that you can do or I can do is live a godly life in the midst of a wicked world. Listen carefully to me, church. It's becoming easier and easier to stand out in this world because it's getting darker and darker. And if we're going to be light, we are going to stand out. We ought to make a difference. A proper reputation. You know Henry Ford, right? I mean, you don't know him, know him, but you know who he is. You might drive one of his vehicles, the Ford Motor Company. Henry Ford said this one day. You can't build a reputation on what you're going to do. Think about that. You can't build a reputation on what you're going to do. I thought about that quote as I came to, and as I thought about it, I came to the conclusion, this is very appropriate for followers of Jesus. The only way to build a reputation is on what you have done, not on what you say you're going to do. And so think about it. Far too often we have good intentions but no follow through. And so we have good intentions. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going to pray more. I'm going to fast. I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I'm going to be more faithful to church. I'm going to do all these things. We've got good intentions that ultimately are never done. We never fulfill them. And so our reputation is that of unfaithful, unfit, unattractive to a lost and dying world. You can't build a reputation on what you're going to do. It's got to be what you do. A good reputation isn't built on good intentions. It's built on good and godly deeds. So if we're going to have a good reputation, we've got to get busy. We can't just stare at the sky and say, Jesus, we're waiting for you to return. No. We've got to live faithfully. As we review this passage, as we look at what Paul is saying to us, we notice how, how practical the Christian walk really is. We live a holy life. We're to be holy. We're to live holy, faithful, following the Lord Jesus, abstaining from sexual immorality, walking in the Holy Spirit. We're to live in harmony. What does he say? Loving one another and showing that love to other people properly. We're to live in honesty by working with our hands, not meddling in the affairs of other people and doing what God has called us to do. When unsaved people see this happening in the church... Christ is magnified and glorified. When they see that our lives are different, God receives glory, and they will either oppose it with envy or desire it because they see the difference for themselves. Either way, God receives the glory. And so we are called to live faithful, consistent, godly lives in the midst of a wicked, crazy, chaotic world. The good news is this. God doesn't just tell us to do it. He empowers us to do it. Through his word and through the Holy Spirit. 